Good morning, everybody. Uh, welcome to uh, today's version of the Pineland Speaker Series. Um, we're a couple minutes ahead. I think we're just about ready to go live. Um, this morning, we have uh, Edwin Grouski. He works with the New Jersey Pinelands Commission. He's our Environmental Technologies Coordinator, and he's going to talk about the uh, potential impacts of climate change on the New Jersey Pinelands. Uh, it should be a very interesting program. I know Ed's worked pretty hard on this program and he's uh, given it a couple times to some students and uh, we've got a lot of good feedback. So I'm uh, looking forward to it today. And uh, with that, I'd like to turn it over to Ed uh, Wingrowski and uh, we'll be ready to go here in a second. All righty. Thank you, Joel. All right. Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to the fourth Pioneer Speaker Series webinar on uh, the topic of climate change. Um, and as Joel mentioned, uh, we've done this presentation previously. Uh, originally, I was asked by Lisa Allmiller of the uh, uh, Rutgers uh, Cli Coastal Climate Risk and Resilience Program to talk to her students about the uh, challenges and successes related to climate change that have uh, been the experience of the New Jersey Pinelands Commission. So I originally did it in 2019 where we had the students come and uh, meet with us at the commission's headquarters. Uh, in 2020, because of COVID, we did it uh, similar to how we're doing it today. Um, and I've periodically updated the presentation as new information has come available. Um, and in this particular presentation, I had the benefit of some great work that was just released in June of 2020 by the uh, NJDEP, and we'll talk about some of that throughout the presentation. Uh, so quick introduction to the New Jersey Pinelands, an ecologically sensitive environment. You'll see on your screen uh, that image on the upper left, uh, kind of a quintessential Pinelands pond. You can see the tea colored water that's characteristic of Pineland surface waters uh, due to leaching of tannins from vegetation that surrounds those water bodies. Uh, upper right is the Pine Barrens tree frog. I kind of consider that the uh, kind of the unofficial mascot of the Pinelands, but it's uh, significant because it is a species that is highly sensitive to changes, degradation in the environment. Uh, it can uh, thrive only in a specific pH range, that typical of uh, what we would call reference low pH conditions. Um, and when those conditions change because of uh, degradation in water quality, uh, the Pine Barrens tree frog kind of gets nudged out of that ecosystem and gets replaced by competitive species that can take advantage of that altered, uh, actually degraded water quality. Uh, lower left is the pitcher plant. Uh, I include it because it's a good example of a plant adaptation. Uh, because we've got nutrient poor conditions in the Pinelands, uh, this is a plant that can thrive because it has the ability to attain nutrients by capturing insects within its, uh, with it, within its pitcher. And that last picture on the lower right, a coastal estuary, I put that in there just as a reminder that the Pinelands uh, is the headwaters to these coastal estuaries, some of the most productive ecosystems on the planet. Um, and we drain to both the Atlantic and the Delaware. So uh, we're, we're the headwaters. Uh, and uh, what happens in the Pinelands really shows up in these downstream water bodies. A couple quick facts about the Pinelands. The Pinelands Commission uh, essentially came about as a result of federal and state designations in 1978 and 1979. Uh, we're governed by a 15-member panel of Pinelands Commissioners. The commission is an independent political subdivision of the state government. Uh, Pinelands area covers approximately 1 million acres or 20% of New Jersey's land area. Um, and it's protected through a combination of land use controls and environmental programs, some of which I'll talk about throughout the program. Uh, it's a rare ecosystem, like I said, characterized by low pH, nutrient poor streams that are fed by shallow groundwater. Uh, beneath the surface of the Pinelands is the Kirkwood Cohansey Aquifer, nearly 18 gil uh, a trillion gallons of water. Uh, it's an unconfined aquifer, meaning that uh, it's very vulnerable to contamination that can reach that aquifer from surface or just subsurface discharges. Um, 
if you were to take all the water that's contained within the Kirkwood Cohansey and bring it up to the ground surface, it would cover the entire state of New Jersey under 10 feet of water. Uh, the region is habitat for numerous threatened and endangered animal species and plant species. And like I mentioned before, uh, it is the headwaters to um, both the Atlantic and Delaware basins. Uh, this is, an ex this is a, 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 a slide showing the uh, Pinelands land capability map. Really, I kind of consider this to be an example or a product of uh, a regulatory land use planning, regional land use planning. And you can see that the region is divided into nine management areas. Uh, the preservation area district, you'll see on that chart on the right, uh, is really characterized by wilderness. It's the critical ecosystem, one that is uh, unique to the area and one that deserves the highest level of protection. The forest area in slightly darker green is very similar in character to the preservation area district. Um, and then we've got these areas where uh, agriculture is an important uh, component to the social structure, the social fabric of the Pinelands. The special ag area is where we see the native agricultural blueberries and cranberries produced. The brown area is where we've got farms that are in the uplands regions of the Pinelands, where uplands field crops are typically grown. Um, and then we've got this uh, rural development area, which is kind of the transition between what I would say is the highly protected forest and, and preservation area district and the more intensive de intensively developed growth areas. So the rural development area, we kind of think of that as the buffer, the in-between. Uh, the regional growth area, uh, villages and towns are areas where there's a significant amount of development. It was actually encouraged as part of this regional land use plan. The idea was to protect the core regions of the Pinelands, but at the same time accommodate growth on the periphery uh, to allow for economic development and the like. Um, and then we've also got a couple military installations in the Pinelands, uh, federal enclaves, uh, the joint base to the north and the uh, FTEC uh, center to the south, just outside of Atlantic City where the military conducts its operations. No talk about the Pinelands would be complete without a discussion of the underlying aquifer system. So you can see there's a number of aquifers that underlie the region. The aquifers are in blue. The Kirkwood Cohansey is that surface most important water table aquifer, uh, the one that our regulations specifically charge us with protecting. And then you can see in those pale yellow uh, zones, uh, areas that are defined as confining units. If you look at this, um, this depiction down here in the lower right, you'll see that the confining units are really not confining units. The confining units, they are semi-permeable. Uh, they do provide some measure of protection to the confined aquifers that are below them, but water does move through them. And if you take a look on this slide here, these are the recharge areas. When I drive through the Pinelands Forest, I look at all of that forest area that just acts as a sponge and allows all of this rainfall to soak through the ground, recharge that aquifer. Once it gets into the aquifer, it moves under a gradient that is essentially gonna eventually bring it to discharge areas shown over here on that slide. And that, those would be our wetlands and our streams. And you can see those flow lines show that the water travels um, in units that are measured in both days, years, centuries, and thousands of years, depending on the pathway that it takes from the point that that raindrop hits the ground until it ultimately uh, surfaces either in a pumping well or in a discharge area like a stream or a wetland. And then over here just shows the, uh, the aerial extent of the Kirkwood Cohansey Aquifer basically covering uh, not just the Pinelands but even areas outside the Pinelands region. I just wanna note uh, climate change is a hot topic everywhere in the world as it needs to be. It's a hot topic at the Pinelands. Uh, the last annual report that was issued by the executive director in 2019 uh, really highlights the fact that uh, climate change has been a new focus for the commission. Um, and the executive director points out that the CMP allows the commission to be well positioned to address climate change on a regional scale. And that's primarily because those rules protect large areas of, of forests and wetlands that serve as groundwater recharge areas wildlife habitat, habitat 
and significant carbon sinks for all that carbon to be sequestered in vegetation and soils. Uh, the CMP protects water resources, requires on-site aquifer recharge from large storm events. I'll talk a little bit about that later. Uh, we've modified our rules in the last 10 years or so to encourage solar photovoltaics, uh, both on rooftops and pervious surfaces. Uh, they get the green light automatically. Um, and we've reevaluated our rules to allow them on properly closed landfills and some other sites, uh, brownfield type sites that I'll talk about also later. Uh, in 2020, we anticipate some new rules that are going to increase the protection to both stream flow and wetlands hydrology. Um, and in 2019, we saw the creation of a new subcommittee of the commission, the Land Use Climate Impacts and Sustainability Committee. We call it the Climate Change Committee. Uh, those folks, along with staff, are investigating improved energy efficiency, adding solar voltaics and electric vehicle charging stations at the commission's headquarters. Um, there's a link at the bottom of this page to that annual report. Um, and I would note that one of the uh, most encouraging topics that I heard from one of the uh, committee members was that that committee member intended to look at every new rule proposed by the Pinelands Commission through the lens of climate change. Uh, so that's encouraging. So our understanding of climate change in the Pinelands area is primarily informed by the generous uh, presentations that were provided by Dr. David Robinson, a distinguished professor at Rutgers and the New Jersey State climatologist. Uh, you'll see at the bottom of my screen here, Dr. Robinson has addressed the commission um, and Pinelands enthusiasts going back to at least 2011 um, and even provided a early presentation in this Pinelands speaker series back in June 11th dealing with climate change in the Pinelands. And you can, if you didn't see it, you can find that on the commission's uh, uh, webpage. You can link to those YouTube videos that are archived. I also mentioned that we have received an abundance of information that's included in this presentation by reviewing in depth DEP's recently released June 30th, 2020, uh, scientific report on climate change. Um, chock full of information pertinent, not just to the Pinelands, but to all regions of New Jersey. And I pulled out a couple things here uh, that are highlighted in that scientific report. I'm gonna talk about them further, but just as examples, uh, it's unmistakable that Earth's climate is changing faster now than at any point in the history of modern civilization. Uh, Frighteningly, New Jersey may become unsuitable for specialty crops like blueberries and cranberries because those crops need winter chills, winter chills that we're no longer experiencing and we'll probably see less of in the future. Uh, the persistence, persistence of the southern pine beetle in New Jersey is kind of a harbinger of what we can expect with the introduction of invasive species that are able to move into the area and establish a stronghold here again because of those warmer winters and wildfires have always been an inherent component of the Pinelands. Uh, climate change with increased temperatures, extended dry periods are likely to result in um, increased and perhaps more intensive wildfires. So I mentioned that there have been four presentations previously dealing with climate change. Uh, part of the Pineland Speaker Series, Dr. Robinson's presentation. We had one by uh, Karen Walzer and Becky LeBoy. This is kind of uh, think globally, act locally, combating climate change with a Jersey friendly yard, what you can do in your own yard to address climate change. We had a great one, I think it was last week by Allegra Mitchell, climate change and what it means for amphibians in New Jersey. And I also want to invite your attention to a presentation that was not part of the speaker series but was given to the Climate Change Committee by uh, Professor Michael Gerard. 
professor at Columbia Law School. Um, and he discussed potential actions that could be taken by the Pinelands Commission to address climate change. And I've got a link here at the bottom of this page to a work that he co-edited, uh, Deep Decarbonization in the United States, Summary and Recommendations. It's really worth checking out. There's some great recommendations in there for policymakers. So this slide here comes from DEP's uh, recent uh, scientific report. And it identifies the sources of greenhouse gases that are responsible for climate change. Transportation uh, is the leading source of greenhouse gas in New Jersey. Um, cars, trucks, buses, and the like. Electricity generation, those are the power plants that are burning fossil fuels. Uh, commercial and industrial, so that would be both heating and cooling of those structures, but also industrial discharges. So uh, for instance, concrete manufacturing uh, produces significant carbon dioxide um, discharges uh, as an example of an industrial discharge that is leading um, a leading cause of uh, uh, climate change. Residential heating and cooling, we can address that with um, energy efficiency in buildings. These highly warming gases, these are things like refrigerants um, and in particular uh, insulators, electrical insulators that have come on the market uh, to replace PCBs that are, uh, I believe, thousands of times more potent than um, CO2. Um, waste management, so this would be methane discharges from sanitary landfills um, and wastewater treatment plants. And land clearing, which I suspect is the result of soil disturbance where, where we're releasing carbon that's sequestered in the soil um, and allowing it to discharge to the atmosphere. And you can see that terrestrial carbon sequestration only takes about 8% of all of those carbon sources out of the environment. So this graph also comes from DEP, um, and I find this very interesting. So you can see they've identified those same sources, ve vehicular electricity buildings and the like. Um, and those are the current uh, million metric tons per year generated by those sources. And that dashed line at the bottom represents the target established in the Global Warming Response Act. And in essence, what the goal of New Jersey is will be to bring all of those sources all plotted along this line so that they all produce less gas than what would be identified by this line right here. So we're probably in the area, it looks like 24.1 is what they say. So we've got a lot of aggressive action to take. Now, the original target was an 80% reduction by 2050. I spoke with Dr. Nick Procopio at DEP just the other day. He told me that the latest projections now show that a 75% reduction is required. That equates to about a 2.3% reduction in all of these greenhouse gas emissions that are necessary between now and the year 2050 to meet those targets. In this slide, I identify the various Pinelands management areas um, and the challenges that will be faced by those management areas as a result of climate change. So just to pick a few examples, in the preservation and forest area, we know that we're likely to see more intensive wildfires, uh, increased invasive in insect species, instability in forest composition. I'll talk about that a little bit later. Uh, water quality may degrade because when we get higher temperatures, we get lower dissolved oxygen in that water, putting stress on aquatic organisms. Uh, the ag and special ag areas, we have the potential for longer growing seasons, but that will likely bring insect infestations and fungal disease, the likelihood of droughts, deluges, heat stress on those crops. We may actually see a reduction in crop yields and certainly increased irrigation demands as we get into droughty conditions during the growing season, requiring greater withdrawals of uh, water for irrigation. Uh, the regional growth, towns and villages, uh, we need to maintain, sustain 
a water supply so that the people get the water that they require. Uh, we anticipate that there will be public health and disease uh, impacts as a result of climate change in those areas. Uh, stormwater management, uh, we, we recognize that with increased storms, higher intensity storms, our existing stormwater infrastructure is probably not adequate to address those larger volume storms. Uh, certainly displaced coastal populations will confront the regional growth towns and villages. Uh, I'm gonna talk about that later, but we're gonna see a, uh, a migration from the shoreline um, and those people are gonna to wanna to move somewhere, uh, probably close to home and put some pressure on the Pinelands to accommodate that displaced population. Uh, the rural development area, that's that kind of uh, a boundary between the wilderness areas and the developed areas. We've got concerns with the wildfire um, impacts on the wildlands urban interface. We need to protect built structures from fires in that region. Uh, health and disease, stormwater resources, stormwater management, um, similar to what were threats in those other regions. And in the federal and mil military installations, I would suggest that uh, wildfire, drought, heat-related illness are certainly uh, issues there. Uh, but, but our military also responds to worldwide humanitarian missions um, and we can anticipate climate-related global conflict uh, that may require military response. Um, and so those are aspects of our military operations that will be uh, affected by climate change. This slide I adapted from one that Dr. Robinson had presented in a 2016 Pineland short course, uh, potential climate change manifestations and impacts. So those are the things that we are likely to see, rising temperatures, precipitation events, uh, extreme uh, drought, sea level rise, and on the right, we talk about the health impacts, agricultural impacts, forest impacts, water resource impacts, infrastructure, and species and landscape impacts. So all of these items are discussed in a little more detail throughout this presentation, um, but you can see that there's virtually every aspect of the natural environment, natural ecology, and human ecology that will be affected by these various uh, aspects, manifestations of climate change. Uh, these are great slides. I, I found these when I was doing some research. Uh, it's a really good way for people to get a feel for what the climate is likely to be like, in this case, 60 years down the road. So you can see that we're predicting that summers, for instance, in Atlantic City, will feel more typical of a summer today in Elizabeth City, North Carolina, where their summers are about 3.4 degrees warmer and 37.1 degrees wetter than what we experience in Atlantic City. So those Southern climates are marching forward. This one compares winter temperatures and in Philadelphia uh, with uh, the current high rate of greenhouse gas emissions. Philadelphia is likely to feel in the wintertime more like North South Memphis, Tennessee, and their winters are about 9.1 degrees warmer and 41.1% uh, percent wetter. Uh, these slides are reminiscent of something that I saw years ago. I was uh, skiing up in the Catskills and I picked up the New York State Conservation Magazine, and it, it was probably at least 10 years ago where the New York State skiing industry was basically projecting similar migration of climate patterns, uh, suggesting that ski areas in the Catskills and the Adirondacks may no longer be able to sustain skiing operations because of this northward march of warmer temperatures. So wildfire um, is a key component to the Pinelands. And this map here by DEP shows where the fuel hazards exist in New Jersey. And you can see in that Pinelands region, we're anywhere from high, very high to extreme in terms of the amount of fuel hazard that typically exists in, that, in our region. Uh, now the Pine Barrens is a fire adapted ecosystem. It depends on wildfire for the reproduction of the dominant plant species, Pinus rigida, the pitch pine. Uh, pitch pines are ideally adapted to uh, fire prone conditions. Uh, they thrive in the sandy acidic drought 
prone soils of the pinelands. They've got serotonous cones that are covered by a resin and they release their seeds only when exposed to fire. And that picture on the upper right shows seeds, a seed cone that has opened up as a result of fire. Those seeds get relieved and they released and they get carried in the updraft of the fire and settle back down um, and basically allow for uh, sprouting of new pitch pines. Uh, the bark on these pitch pines is platy, uh, kind of like if you took a newspaper and rolled it up and threw it in the uh, fireplace to burn, the interior of that uh, uh, newspaper log would not burn because of the insulating effect of those layers. Um, and in the aftermath of a wildfire, the pitch pines are amongst the first to sprout, uh, new, to generate new sprouts um, and quickly reestablish themselves uh, post fire conditions. So New Jersey has quite a task in protecting the built environment from a fire adapted ecosystem. And we spent a lot of financial resources in managing, protecting that interface. Prescribed burns are an ever more important component of managing wildfire risk. There's some selective thinning that's occurred in this one forest here to the right of the prescribed burn uh, photo. Uh, we've got men and women in fire lookout towers that are constantly scanning the horizon for evidence of a fire so that they can respond to it quickly. Um, and we've got a whole host of vehicles that are at the availability of the New Jersey Forest Fire Service to allow the Forest Fire Service to quickly respond to forest fires. Uh, extensive network of uh, fire lookout towers exists throughout the Pinelands region. I've shown them all here. Um, I recall one when I was a kid growing up in Lakewood off New Hampshire Avenue, it seems to have been dismantled probably because the forests that were in that area then are no longer there. Uh, but th this extensive network of fire lookout towers, um, although they're becoming uh, aged and likely to be uh, need to be replaced with some perhaps new modern technology, uh, they are a key component to uh, managing wildfire risk in the region. Uh, new Jersey's uh, Forest Fire Service has maintained uh, historic record keeping that identifies where wildfires have occurred between 1924 and 2011. And you can see where the hot spot is. It's right there in the New Jersey Pinelands. Um, uh, th there's color coding there that shows the period, the years in which those fires occurred, but you can see they're concentrated in the Pinelands region. Uh, the Forest Fire Service is constantly monitoring all of the critical elements that basically produce conditions that are ideal for a, a wildfire. So they're monitoring wind speed and direction, percent humidity, the, the uh, moisture content in the forest fuels uh, at the, uh, on the forest floor. Um, we see when we drive through the Pinelands forest fire danger ratings uh, that identify what the current condition is to allow people to be more cautious. Um, and throughout New Jersey, we have in our, um, in our campgrounds and, and, uh, and, and um, forest management areas, uh, various stages that protect against fire based upon these monitored conditions, such that if you're camping in the Pinelands, you may be allowed to have under the most ideal conditions a small campfire in a uh, like a steel fire ring, that restriction may be um, imp uh, imposed to a greater degree so that fires are only allowed on camp stoves. Um, and under the most hazardous conditions, no fires at all, not even on your camp stove, all based upon the monitoring that's done by the Forest Fire Service. And we've got a task to pr protect the built environment from a fire adapted ecosystem. This wildland urban interface um, is the critical zone where we've got to defend that built infrastructure from that natural system that wants to burn periodically. The Pinelands Plan, the CMP, provides a couple measures of protection uh, that aim to preserve or protect that built environment. Uh, we require defensive space, fire breaks around structures at the wildland urban interface. Uh, our rules provide guidance, but not yet regulation that uh, suggests that fire resistant roof and exterior building materials should be used in those structures. Um, and there's an absolute need for the maintenance of multiple access roads and escape routes 
in the event a fire were to threaten these developed areas. I think this picture here um, I took off of a Google, Google map and it shows um, the area of uh, probably a senior citizen development in um, Berkeley Township. A couple of years back, the commission partnered with a group of researchers, graduate students from the University of Alabama and NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center. Um, and essentially they used satellites to identify uh, the ideal location for urban development uh, or intensive development relative to wildfire risk. Um, and what the key findings show is that the extremely high risk areas are primarily those that are within the preservation area in which development is prohibited. Um, and the regional growth area has the least total area under high fire risk. This is an example of where the CMP can be credited with reducing risk to infrastructure and public safety by directing development away from those wildlands, heavily forested areas and redirecting it out toward the periphery. So precipitation is certainly um, <clears throat> uh, a um, element of climate change. Uh, I've been with the Pinelands Commission since 2002. So just a couple of years after I joined the commission, we had these extensive uh, floods that occurred through Burlington and Camden counties, the flood of July 12th and 13th, and USGS uh, wrote a report on this particular incident, uh, up to 13.2 inches of rain at a rate of about three inches per hour, not associated with a hurricane. Uh, the Rancocas, Pensauken Creeks, and Cooper Ritter Rivers uh, all experienced extensive flooding. Uh, 45 dams were topped, 28 dams damaged, and 17 dams completely failed. Uh, the 500 flood, 500 year flood elevation was exceeded at numerous sites. Uh, more than 1,200 homes were flood damaged. There was contamination of drinking water supplies and sewage system failures, and 25 major road closures occurred, including the Turnpike Route 70 and Route 73, uh, with serious damage or destruction of 14 bridges. So you can see that these intense storms have the potential to impose severe damage to our built infrastructure. Uh, the South Jersey deratio of June 2012, um, at the time, was a new term to me. Uh, we just experienced deratio in South Jersey just, I think, sometime mid-July. Uh, this particular deratio, these super strong winds, 78 mile, uh, 80, I'm sorry, 87 mile per hour straight line winds were recorded at the Atlantic City Airport. 206,000 homes without power for more than a week during a nine day stretch of 90 to 100 degree heat and humidity. Now, not only is that uncomfortable, but if you're elderly and you're in a home and you've got 90 to 100 degree heat, uh, maybe not just the elderly, infants as well, and you've got no way to keep cool, then we turn a uncomfortable event into a dangerous event. Uh, thousands of trees uprooted and destroyed. Uh, the recurrence interval of these is supposed to be on the order of every two to four years. Um, and this was an example where there was some um, necessary action on the part of the, our executive director having to make an emergency declaration to allow the temporary um, storage of debris that was being collected by public works departments, uh, collected and stored temporarily in areas where our Pinelands plan wouldn't normally allow it, uh, but we had no choice but to provide that level of flexibility. Um, and I'm sure with these storms that just came through, I know firsthand, having seen some of the damage in Hamilton, similar provisions are likely um, in the aftermath of uh, those uh, recent storms. Uh, so hail is also associated with some of these high intensity thunderstorms. Um, and this picture just caught my eye because uh, I don't know if this is resilience, ingenuity or what, but I think it's brilliant somebody protecting their cherished Jeep with uh, blow up air mattresses. Uh, I look at this picture and I wonder what's in the garage. 
But nevertheless, this hail damage can be quite severe. We had a little bit of hail, hail uh, just recently this summer, nothing that would cause extensive damage, but the potential is there, especially with future climate change, more intense hail events. Stormwater management in the Pinelands has always been important. Uh, the Pinelands plan since 1981 has required groundwater recharge for aquifer, uh, aquifer replenishment from storm events. There's a mandatory recharge of the volume of runoff from the 10 year storm. That's a large storm event on the order of five inches of rainfall that occurs a new impervious surface. Our rules require that that stormwater be managed and recharged to the groundwater system on site. Uh, this is a much significantly larger stormwater recharge requirement in the Pinelands that occurs outside the Pinelands region. Um, and we know that storms have increased intensity and with increased runoff, we will likely need to reevaluate re not only our rules, but also uh, the existing infrastructure that is designed to um, protect us from those uh, potential flooding events. I, I will note that DEP just announced that they are going to likely introduce a proposed rule amendment that will increase the volume from the two, 10 and 100 year storm and require that future development be built so that those volumes are addressed 30% higher than current uh, NOAA uh, storm requirements. Uh, DEP uh, DEP's basing that 30% increase on some work that was done in New York State, inc that included some weather stations in North Jersey. Um, and DEP is going to use the same scientists that modeled those storm event predictions to do something similar for New Jersey uh, so that we can anticipate future more intensive storms in our stormwater regulations. So climate change also has the potential to impact the uh, renovation of wastewater that's provided by on-site soil dispersal and treatment systems. So the rules in New Jersey require that conventional septic systems be built with a minimum four foot separation to the seasonal high groundwater table. So that's indicated by this seasonal high water table um, uh, symbol here. Uh, if water table rises and we have those water tables that are encroaching up into our zone of treatment, we no longer have the required four foot unsaturated zone through which we remove pathogens from wastewater. If we get areas where seasonal high water tables rise, particularly along the coastal areas due to saltwater intrusion, uh, we may need to revisit those existing septic systems and uh, convert them to mounded systems, require advanced treatment systems so that we get that same level of pathogen removal that conventional septic systems are providing for us today. So coastal storms, and I guess the, uh, the mother of all storms, at least in my memory, is Superstorm Sandy, October 2012. Uh, we all live through it, but I just want to point out some of the unique challenges that a storm like that imposed upon the Pinelands. So we had all of that flooding that caused extensive vehicles, uh, ex extensive vehicle damage along the barrier islands and the inland bays. Um, and the insurance companies went in and towed those vehicles uh, ultimately for resale, but they were staged without approval from the Pinelands Commission in the Pinelands forest area. And we started, the commission started to get calls that these tow trucks were bringing these vehicles into an area that was not properly designated nor protected to store these types of storm damaged vehicles. Uh, over 5,000 of them ended up in the forest management area of the Pinelands. The 50 acre site basically was converted to a junkyard almost overnight. Uh, there was serious concern about the potential for groundwork contamination. Uh, and other, um, uh, well, groundwater contamination from leaking gasoline, motor fuel, other automotive fluids. Uh, we, court action was required to address the violation. Once those vehicles were taken off site, uh, we required phase one environmental site assessments to identify and rectify any surface contamination that resulted from leakage from those vehicles. And ultimately, the site was restored and stabilized um, after that occurred. But this is an example how even coastal storms 
can have an impact on the inland environment uh, in a manner that was probably unanticipated prior to this particular event. The Ash Wednesday storm of March uh, 1962, this was the great nor'easter um, that was uh, extreme in the fact that it lingered over five high tide cycles uh, occurring over three days. And LBI was just pummeled where the ocean waters overtopped the island in five locations. Seven deaths occurred, 600 homes on the island were destroyed. Uh, I, I would say that I'm anxious to get a hold of a National Geographic issue that I recall seeing years ago as a kid that had some tremendous photos from this storm showing homes that were dragged out to sea and pushed into Barnegat Bay. Um, uh, but in any event, all of those wrecked homes and their contents needed to be put somewhere. And this was before the Pinelands Commission existed. So the uh, most convenient place to bring them was into the Pine Barrens uh, at the site of the uh, former Stafford Township landfill. Um, and so we need to recognize as a land use planning agency with the potential for future coastal storms to occur that there may be the need to accommodate these unanticipated large volumes of wreckage from these coastal storm events. Uh, the most likely place that that stuff is going to come uh, is into the Pinelands. The Cape May MUA operates the only landfill. It's a modern controlled landfill um, in the Pinelands today with uh, leachate liner collection system, uh, cap, um, gas collection. Um, and it's likely that future storms may result in additional refuse being brought there um, because it's got to go somewhere. Sea level rise now, nobody's suggesting that we're going to see in our lifetimes or any time thereafter, sea levels rise to this level. But this is an example of sea level that did once occur on Earth when uh, uh, a deviation in our, uh, rota in, in our rotation around the sun um, caused all the ice on the planet Earth to melt, um, causing water to rise 66 meters above its um, current uh, elevation. And a uh, very graphic example that just identifies how much ice, how much water is bound up in the um, polar regions of the planet. Saltwater intru intrusion and its impact to uh, surface waters in the Pinelands ecosystem. Uh, so I kind of view this as occurring under two different scenarios. Uh, one would be episodic, where we have a storm event that pushes a storm surge inland, um, and it basically drives that salt water up into our freshwater estuaries, causing extensive vegetation damage, um, not just by wind-driven waves, but also by salt spray. Um, and then we had, and so that's episodic. That occurs as a result of storms. And we've got some photos here that show uh, exactly the damage that was uh, the result of these episodic um, storm-driven uh, surges of salt water into the uh, uh, coastal, inland coastal regions. We also anticipate that we're going to have chronic uh, intrusions of salt water into these regions as sea levels continue to rise, albeit slowly, pushing that saltwater, freshwater inf interface further inland. Um, and you can see in these photos, the Atlantic white cedar does not tolerate salt, leaving behind these ghost forests or cedar cemeteries. Um, and many other plants in the Pinelands are threatened by uh, this uh, in, in intrusion of salt water. And I just read this morning that the DRBC is very concerned that sea level rise is gonna drive the salt water, fresh water uh, margin further up the Delaware River, potentially threatening the water intakes for um, you know, perhaps thousands, I'm not sure, perhaps millions of people. So very serious concern with salt water intrusion. The USGS studied the hydrology of uh, potential e effects of sea level rise on the Kirkwood Cohansey Aquifer, uh, focusing on the Forsyth uh, Wildlife Management Area. That's this area right here. Uh, much of it in the Pinelands National Reserve, not within the Pinelands boundary, uh, but we've essentially taken what USGS identified uh, will likely occur to the Kirkwood Cohansey in this region um, and applied it to the Pinelands. In all likelihood, we'll see those impacts um, 
further inland. Um, and so what USGS tells us is that as sea levels rise, groundwater discharge to freshwater wetlands and streams is likely to increase. Water tables are likely to rise and the interface between freshwater and saltwater is likely to move inland. And the reason for that is pretty much this right here. Seawater is about 2.5% denser than freshwater. And so because it's denser, it sinks to the bottom and forms this wedge. And as this wedge moves inland, it pushes that freshwater up, creating all of those elevations in water tables, increased discharges to wetlands and streams. And we can anticipate all of those events to occur as a result of saltwater intrusion. I mentioned earlier managed retreat. Um, as the coastal population becomes uh, more and more threatened by rising sea levels and severe storm damage, and we lose homes and we lost a number of homes that were not rebuilt after Superstorm Sandy, um, there will be some pressure perhaps put on the Pinelands to accommodate those residents and businesses that are displaced as a result of that um, sea level rise. Uh, Rutgers Center for Remote Sensing and Spatial Analysis has some tools that identify uh, uh, vulnerability. In this case, I've shown their social vulnerability uh, that would result as uh, res resulting from a two foot rise in sea level. Um, and to put it in the context of the Pinelands, a population of over 33,000 residents are in at-risk homes in Ocean County alone. Uh, those 33,000 residents would be threatened by a 1.5 foot rise in sea level. And about 65% of those people reside in municipalities with at least some of their land area in the Pinelands. So all of these residents and businesses are right at our doorstep and certainly vulnerable to sea level rise. Uh, further impacting the inland communities is the significant uh, loss of tax base that will be re realized when uh, there's no choice but to abandon those water uh, proximate properties and um, losing all of that value that right now uh, significantly supports the inland uh, communities. So agriculture is certainly going to see impacts from climate change. We know that we'll have longer growing seasons. There may be some short-term increased yields, but there is the risk of heat stress. Increased pest populations taking advantage of those longer seasons. Uh, increased chance of drought, uh, droughts and flash droughts. Increased evaporation of water from farmland soil. Uh, torrential rains causing crop damage. Hail causing crop damage. Uh, and we just know that we're going to anticipate, based on what uh, Dr. Robinson tells us, harsh weather extremes. Um, and it's also likely that higher atmospheric CO2 levels will favor the growth of invasive weeds, potentially leading to increased reliance on herbicides. Similarly, increased temperatures favoring insects and plant pathogens may likely increase the reliance on pesticides. Now, sprinklers can be used to cool crops during intensive heat spells. Um, but that comes with um, some downsides. There's the increased stress on our water supplies. Um, those sprinklers leave the crops vulnerable to fungus contaminate, uh, fungus uh, disease infestations. Uh, and 2005, 2006, New Jersey saw uh, the federal government declare uh, disaster areas because of excessive heat, precipitation, weather events. Uh, we anticipate there will be shifts in the plant growing range, um, and there's a significant threat, as I mentioned earlier, to the cranberry and blueberry crop that require long winter chill periods to set their fruit. And Pinelands upland agriculture is not immune to damaging effects of ground level ozone. And let me differentiate between um, stratospheric ozone the ozone layer in the upper reaches of our atmosphere that block harmful UV rays, sometimes referred to as good ozone, and bad ozone, which is the ozone or smog, a photochemical pollutant that is the result of oxygen combining with nitrous oxides from industrial emissions, but primarily from automobiles, that knocks 
interacting with VOCs from gasoline engines, from paints that are evaporating in the presence of sunlight create ozone, a severe irritant, but also a, um, a damaging uh, byproduct that is uh, likely to cause severe losses in soybean, wheat, green peppers, and green uh, peppers and green beans, crops that are all grown in the upland regions of the Pinelands. And forests, we can see where the forests are distributed in New Jersey. Uh, we have the bulk of the forests, as, I, as far as I can tell, uh, from this map here uh, in the Pinelands region. And the Pinelands forest is uh, some of the largest unbroken forest in the eastern U.S. Approximately 500,000 acres of forested land occurs in the Pinelands National Reserve, uh, 15,000 acres in the extensive pygmy pine forest. Uh, I mentioned many rare plants and animals uh, inhabit those Pinelands forests, some at both their northern and southern geographic limits, some that are um, found only here in the Pinelands of New Jersey. And we see threats to the Pinelands forest as, re as a result of climate change, the southern pine beetle. I, I said earlier, this is a harbinger perhaps of things to come. The southern pine beetle is here primarily and having a resurgence because of our warmer winters and the cold winters were able to keep it in check. The warmer winters are allowing it to winter over. It's extremely destructive. Joel and I toured some forest in the Pinelands a couple of years ago and looked at some of this damage. Uh, Cornell University's done a lot of research in conjunction with the scientists at the uh, Rutgers Pinelands uh, Science Research Center to look at this uh, insect, uh, but it's, rapidly infesting areas in the Pinelands. Um, and these warmer temperatures and the spread of the beetle may contribute to a shift away from the pitch pine um, and favoring the loblolly pine is, is what the uh, scientists are predicting. So wildfire, this was a, a severe fire in 2019, 11,000 acres in uh, Woodland and Washington townships. Uh, and ground level ozone. So not only is this a threat to the agricultural crops, but the uh, Fish and Wildlife Service has identified plant species, the National Park Service has identified plant species that are sensitive to ground level ozone. And I did a quick scan of, of this report and I see that the pitch pine and the sassafras, both significant uh, tree species in the Pinelands, are considered to be sensitive to um, ambient levels of ozone. Um, and so this is a threat to um, the Pinelands forest. As we lose Pinelands forests, we run the risk of losing the ecosystem services that those Pinelands forests provide us. They provide aquifer recharge, water purification, uh, soil stabilization, heat island mitigation, and their significant carbon capture that occurs in these pineland forests. Roughly 2.5 million metric tons of carbon emissions are stored in New Jersey's forests. Carbon dioxide gets taken up through photosynthesis as in, as in, and is stored in the vegetation and soils. Uh, it's said that one mature tree absorbs carbon dioxide at a rate of 48 pounds per year. And Dr. Ken Clark over at the Rutgers, uh, at the Rutgers Research Center says that the Pinelands forests are very efficient in storing carbon dioxide, just a bit less so than the rich forests in Pennsylvania and upstate New York. Uh, this is some basic research that was done by the Pineland scientists and others when we were looking at, this is part of the KC study, our Kirkwood Cohansey study, when we were looking at the potential impact of groundwater withdrawals uh, on various indicator species in Pinelands wetlands and uh, ecosystem types. Um, and you can see in this chart that we see that when we reduce the water depth, this is in inches here, two inches, four inches, six inches, what the resultant impact is on these various species. We were using this to identify what would be the maximum allowable withdrawal of a water table impacting a wetland in establishing our forthcoming uh, groundwater withdrawal rules. Now, while this study was intended 
directed specifically toward withdrawals that would occur as a result of pumping water from wells. Uh, I, I suggest that it also has applicability to what could be the impact on these species as a result of water table declines during drought periods. Now, this study assumed permanent reductions in those water tables, and drought conditions are lot, not likely to cause permanent drawdowns in those water tables. It's likely that they would fluctuate from low to high once we rebound out of a, a, a drought situation. But if we looked at these withdrawals in the context of the life cycle of these species, if the frogs were laying eggs at a time when those water tables were being withdrawn as a result of a uh, water tables were being lowered as a result of droughts, we could see what the mortality rate would be perhaps on those tree frogs. And the same thing applies to various types of vegetation. Um, and similar uh, information is shown here. This is withdrawal as a percentage of basin recharge, you can see the impacts that occur when 5% of recharge is removed from that aquifer through pumping. But we can, we can extend some of this um, knowledge to uh, anticipated impacts during long-term drought conditions, particularly if they occur during critical periods in the life cycle of um, these species. And, and I would just mention while I'm on this slide, Pineland scientists have also done a lot of work tracking various species of snakes through the Pinelands. And although that's pure research that's not necessarily directed toward climate change, I would suggest that some of the information that's coming out as a result of that snake tracking, uh, where our scientists through radio tracking know where the snakes are, when, when they're, where they're at, can help with the um, establishment of safe periods of time during which uh, prescribed burns can occur. If we know the snakes are in the move and they're in the forest fire, I'm sorry, if, if they're in the forest litter, uh, we probably wouldn't want to allow prescribed burns to occur, but rather hold off until those snakes are in, in hibernacula and no longer susceptible to the threat of uh, even a prescribed burn. So energy is a critical component in climate change. Due to climate change, the nation's energy system is projected to be increased, increasingly threatened by more frequent, longer lasting power outages. New Jersey is experiencing all of that right now. Um, extreme weather events continue to be leading contributors to transmission generation and load loss. And just recently, New York City, uh, uh, Con Edison, had to cut back power to 33,000 customers for fear that they were going to overload their electrical system. Um, because of uh, intensive use of electricity during these extended heat periods. So people's air, conditionings, air conditioners are running at full tilt during these heat waves, putting a stress on those power systems. Um, more than 8 million customers lost power in 21 states due to Superstorm Sandy. Um, and I found this interesting. There have been other instances where nuclear power plants had to shut down or reduce power generation because the temperature in the water bodies that they were drawing in cooling water from was too high, did not meet specification to provide sufficient cooling for full power generation at those nuclear power plants. So the temperatures can get so high as a result of climate change that the nuclear power plants can't even run efficiently because they can't be cooled as a result of those warming surface water temperatures. So the energy sector is certainly vulnerable to climate conditions. We've got right now power lines that are being repaired throughout the state. Uh, it occurs summertime as a result of this wind damage, it occurs in the wintertime because of these heavy, wet uh, snow and ice storms. Um, I would say that decentralized power, that would be, say, a, a community-based solar voltaic system uh, that serves perhaps a community of seven or 10 homes. Uh, in a clustered development is less vulnerable to power that's being brought in from a distant regional power plant. I put up this uh, picture of the New Jersey Pinelands electric transmission right of way plan. Um, so we recognize the federal government requires that these high voltage transmission lines be protected from damage from vegetation that's occurring along the margins and below those uh, power structures. Uh, this was an example where the Pinelands Commission scientists worked with the um, transmission companies, recognizing that there was a need for maintenance of these right of ways, but 
the scientists did it in a manner that looked at the ecosystem types that existed in those regions and specifically tailored um, maintenance activities that would be least harmful to those um, species that are using that area in those right of ways as habitat. Uh, Atlantic County Utilities Authority has the uh, Jersey Atlantic Wind Farm. Um, that is um, at the ACUA's facility just outside of Atlantic City, wind turbines. Uh, they've got their wind turbines, they've got their uh, solar panels there, uh, not in the Pinelands, but, but very close, very innovative, um, a good source of clean, green, renewable energy. And the Stafford Township landfill um, was impermeably capped, I'm not sure, maybe 10 years ago, uh, perhaps less. And you can see here, this is a Google image where on top of that uh, impermeably capped landfill, uh, ground mounted solar arrays have been installed and there's plans for uh, three or four wind turbines proposed on that relatively high elevation site as well. Uh, this was a controversial project that came before the commission a couple of years ago, the BL England uh, generated st generating station in Upper Township. Uh, controversial because of the route that the natural gas pipeline was going to take, but also because the plant was proposed to be um, fueled with a fossil fuel converted from coal and oil uh, to natural gas. Uh, as it turns out that that, that repowering of the plant um, has essentially gone away. Um, and that opens up an opportunity now for both the BL England generating station and the Oyster Creek generating station, the co closed nuclear plant in Forked River to serve as connection points for offshore wind uh, generation stations that will uh, in essence be able to tie into the existing grid and bring that offshore wind power onshore. We've got two such projects that are in the works. The Atlantic Shores Offshore Wind Project is a 2.5 gigawatt wind turbine power plant proposed enough to power 1 million homes. And the Orsted Ocean Wind Project, a 1.1 gigawatt wind turbine plant that will eventually power one half million homes. Uh, solar energy facilities in the Pinelands, we revised the CMP back in 2012 with amendments so that there's no application required now if someone wants to put solar as an accessory use on any existing structure or impervious surface. So there's no bureaucratic holdup in getting those solar installations installed. We allow in our rules community solar, that decentralized solar that I identified um, a moment ago in clustered residential developments. And there were certain considerations that were given with respect to the scenic beauty of the Pinelands, uh, such that those um, solar photovoltaic systems wouldn't take away the scenic beauty um, from within the Pinelands. And so there's restrictions on where those facilities can be placed. Um, some other restrictions, we looked at the um, interest in clearing forest in the preservation area district or the forest area to put in solar panels. And we said that that's not allowable. Um, it is permitted on remediated brownfield sites. So I mentioned landfills, if they're closed in accordance with the CMP and they're not introducing contamination or there's a cap on them, you can uh, put solar on top of a closed landfill. And we've got several municipalities right now that are pursuing solar projects once they close their landfills. Uh, they would be permitted on previously mined resource extraction sites. So those are the sand and gravel mines in the Pinelands that were not obligated under our rules to re restore the site or reforest the site. And we put in some provisions where they can be allowed with limits in the agricultural production area and the rural development area. Uh, in essence, avoiding putting them on land with the highest ecological value. And there's also limits on clearing for right of ray tr transmission lines. So we wouldn't allow a solar facility to go in that then would require an extensive cut through the forest to bring that power out to the grid. Uh, energy conservation requirements. So the commission was able through an MOA with the Stafford Business Park to require that the development at that facility meet LEED standards. And some of the LEED standard requirements are identified in this uh, slide here, water conservation, no use of CFC-based refrigerants, high use of uh, recycled building materials and the like. So that was something that was done through um, the MOA process. 
and public health. So public health really stands to be threatened by climate change. I was surprised to see the number of uh, asthma sufferers uh, likely in the Pinelands region, uh, based upon some work that the New Jersey State Department of Health has done. So we've got 70,000 asthma sufferers in the Pinelands region, just about 10% of the population. Um, and that ground level ozone uh, is a severe lung irritant and really imposes a severe stress on those with asthma and other pre-existing conditions. Uh, also in the public health, and in this case, recreation category would be cyanobacteria harmful algal blooms in surface waters. Now cyanobacteria called blue-green algae are really bacteria capable of photosynthesis. They occur in freshwater, uh, freshwaters, but also found in coastal waters. They produce a toxin. It can bioaccumulate. It can get in, in the tissue of fish mussels and zooplankton. The toxins can be harmful to humans and fatal to pets. And every year there are some pets that succumb to it when their owners allow those pets to get into these uh, contaminated waters. Uh, these toxins produce gastrointestinal illness, liver disease, neurological effects, and skin reactions in humans. And looking at DEP's website, I saw that Pemberton Lake in Pemberton Township, not far off the Pemberton bypass, has had confirmed uh, harmful algal blooms in 2017, 19, and 20. Now these harmful algal blooms, and I would suggest that we should call them harmful bacterial blooms, because that's really what it is. It's a bacterial bloom that occurs under ideal light, nutrient enrichment, calm waters, and temperature conditions. Uh, and the research suggests that climate change is likely to promote the growth of cyanobacteria. Uh, the, the one thing perhaps that the Pinelands has going for it is that these cyanobacteria have an ideal pH range of 7.5 to 8.5. So that is way above what we would find in naturally acidic Pinelands reference waters. Reference waters being those that are indicative of the pristine Pinelands environment. This picture here of Pancoast Mill Pond that I took in 2017, uh, obviously not a Pinelands reference water, severely degraded water quality in Pancoast Mill Pond, likely the result of a golf course with um, greens and, uh, and fairways that are very close to wetlands that drain into this water body. So although the pristine reference Pinelands waters may be somewhat protected from harmful bacterial blooms, um, these degraded Pinelands water bodies are not so protected. Uh, another thing that we need to consider in terms of public health is the need for rigorous protection of, outdoor, of our outdoor workforce from heat-related illness and even death. Mm -hmm. So OSHA has established in conjunction with the uh, National Weather Service a chart that identifies the heat index that we hear all the time, the feels-like temperature. So, you know, you combine heat and humidity and you get into these feels-like temperatures and OSHA pretty much has some guidelines here that suggest that, you know, super additional protection needs to be given to workers that are working in the sunlight um, or in, in extreme temperatures and high humidity under these conditions. Um, and I, direct sunlight adjusts these heat index temperatures by 15 degrees. So who is at risk as a result of these high temperatures? And I tried to break this down. This is just kind of uh, to give you a rough idea uh, by management area. So in the preservation area district, because of these increased temperatures and at heat index, backpackers, firefighters, research scientists, runners and cyclists in our preservation and, and, and forest areas, certainly the farm workers in our ag and special ag production area are susceptible to these high uh, health um, threatening heat conditions. And various workers in our um, more developed regions, same thing. Um, and I think about the federal and military installations, the people are there wearing protective, protective equipment, handling hazardous materials, construction workers, the soldiers that are training for military operations, all at risk because of uh, these heat indexes that are likely to rise. Uh, Ozone climate penalty, warming climate will increase ozone production. I talked about this already, but so there it is, ground level ozone, severe respiratory irritant um, can cause illness and even death. Elderly, those with asthma, children are particularly vulnerable. 
And you know, it's, it's unfortunate. Ground level ozone is the only national ambient air quality standard that New Jersey continues to fail consistently. We get rated as not in a non-attainment standard uh, for this standard um, pretty much year after year. And it, it is the result of those nitrous oxides, the volatile organic compounds, heat and sunlight. Um, U.S. Centers for Disease Control report higher temperatures lead to increased allergens because of a longer pollen season, increased concentrations of ground level ozone or smog that I talked about. Uh, wildfires, smoke exposure leads to increased respiratory illness and cardiovascular hospitalizations. EPA monitors heat-related deaths, heat-related illness, Lyme disease, West Nile disease, and ragweed pollen, all as climate change indicators. And in their recent report, DEP says that under high emission scenario, climate change could result uh, in an increase, 55% increase in summer heat-related mortalities by the end of this decade compared to the 1990s. And they may double um, uh, more than doubling in mortality by 2050. So very severe. And with that, that is my last slide. Thank you very much. And Joel has me um, asking you to call in with questions. Joel, are you with me? Hello, Ed. This is Joel. Do you got me? I do. Can you hear me, Joel? Uh, you might need to put the screen share back up so people can see the phone number to call in. Uh, yes, I can. Okay. But I think the screen share needs to come back up because you can't see. There you go. Okay. Uh, perfect, Ed. That's great. So if anybody's out there and has a question, please feel free to call in and uh, we'll admit you once uh, your call comes. Thank you, Joel. Yeah, it's just amazing when you think about all of the possible impacts, uh, you know, and effects on our, our daily lives uh, with uh, the ramifications of climate change. It really does affect everything. I saw a video online by New Jersey's Chief Resilience Officer, Dave Rosenblatt. Um, and he talks about how climate change is going to affect everybody in countless ways. And that's exactly what seems to be the case with potential impacts in the Pinelands. So many impacts across the board. Yeah, you're right. And your, your PowerPoint really did show that, that potential. It's really wide ranging and uh, affects just about every aspect of uh, our ecology and our daily lives. Uh, you know, this the storm fed something even very seriously to think about. Even yesterday, there was a prolonged period of thunderstorms that just stayed in the same spot. And I think out by Woodland Township near Chatsworth, they might have received about four inches of rain. Wow. And uh, it was weird. On, on the radar, you could watch the storm, and it kind of blossomed from Pepperton to Tom's River. But then instead of going west like a storm usually does, it actually just kind of dropped and move southeast back down along Route 72, Route 539, down into the Woodland Township catchment area. And uh, it really was a prolonged period of rain, heavy rain, all in, the, in that same particular area. Yeah. 
we we lost power here in Tom's River again yesterday, probably as a result of that particular storm. It had an extreme amount of lightning. Uh, the lightning mm. was really, really uh, pretty intense. Um, on the news, they looked at the radar and they thought they saw some rotations. So there was the possibility, at least the conditions were present, where the winds were moving kind of contrary to each other, which is just about about almost what you would have with a, a tornado or same thing with a straight line of winds. They're all a byproduct of that same function. Yeah, I saw last week's tropical storm had two tornadoes, uh, one in Barnegat and two in South Jersey. So um, yeah, even tornadoes now are becoming evidently perhaps uh, more of a threat in New Jersey. Yeah, for sure. I mean, years ago, that's something you always equate to like the Midwest, Iowa, Kansas, Oklahoma. But our recent history definitely shows that uh, they can and do happen here, right? Even along the coast. Yeah. Your presentation was so detailed, you must, you've answered every possible question out there. Um, <laughs> well, you know, the, oh, thank you, Joel. But the, the fact that it's archived, um, so I would just suggest anybody watched it could always send an email to the commission, and I'd be ha more than happy to, to research and follow up on any questions that come in. Uh, yeah, that's great. That that's a, that's a great way to get a hold of us. Uh, I believe our info, our email is info at and it's Pinelands. Up, oh, we got a call coming in. Let me put them through. Hello, you're uh, live on the air with your question. Hi, I thought it was a great presentation, and the question that I had was is how are you going to deal with these impacts? Are you going to work with each of the communities within the Pinelands or will the Pinelands plan uh, start to address on a broader scale or a more regional scale, the climate impacts? Well, well thank you for the, for the question. Um, and that, that's a great question. So I know the Climate Change Committee um, has identified a couple things that they would like to see the commission undertake at our own headquarters. And I would put this down under the category of leading by example. So I mentioned um, energy efficiency at our facility, um, solar photovoltaics and electrical vehicle charging stations for sure. Um, I also mentioned that at least one of the Climate Change Committee members suggested that any future regulation that the Pinelands Commission proposes, he is going to evaluate through the lens of climate change. So, so that would be a start. I also had a conversation with Dr. Nick Procopio at DEP, and he tells me that the governor's mandate is that the Department of Environmental Protection look at all of its regulations um, through the lens of climate change. Um, and so with, with DEP, many of our regulations are closely tied to DEP's regulations. So for example, their stormwater standard, uh, rainfall totals, we will certainly adopt the uh, increase in future storm totals based upon the work that DEP is going to do. Um, so, so it will be steps taken directly at the commission's headquarters, steps taken to look at any future rules. And I suspect that um, the commission will be working with municipalities, um, uh, seeking input from residents of the Pinelands to uh, solicit ideas on uh, what you all have um, as suggested uh, ways in which the commission can deal with climate change. Um, thank you. Another question, if you don't mind. Sure. Um, you had mentioned that um, because of the Pinelands location, that you were anticipating a flux or potential um, growth spurt in population because of, you know, we'll call it climate, mi climate migration. Yep. yep. Um, so... Right now, you're you have um, some your zonings 
um, for for population in terms of uh, sewer and septic ability, um, water. Um, how will you deal with this new influx? Do you have the capacity, or will you have to start to change your zoning? So, so there is there is certainly additional capacity to accommodate new residents in the Pinelands in the towns, villages, and regional growth areas. So that's already built into the plan. Um, and I suspect that, you know, that future uh, development is actually encouraged in those growth areas in the Pinelands. And that's likely to occur. To, to occur. Uh, my point is that the commission um, is likely going to need to make policy decisions in the future um, in anticipation of what we're calling managed retreat. And so there, uh, there will be some that say, you have to hold the line. You cannot allow any development in these areas that the plan right now designates um, as protected zones or establishes minimum densities. And there will be other advocates that say, no, we, we have to modify the plan. We have to accommodate for this managed retreat. So those are policy decisions that will not be made at the staff level. They will be made by the commissioners that basically are charged that write the rules. The rules are their rules. So, but but I pointed out as something that as policymakers, uh, they need. We all need to anticipate that we will likely face that challenge. It, it's it will be something that will be debated on both sides, and then the commissioners will basically have to decide by majority vote uh, where they come down on that issue. Is there any word on the appointment of the commissioners? Not that I'm aware of, but you know, let me let me add one other thing to what I had just said. Uh, mm -hmm. So, uh, the Pinelands, and I don't know the fact off the top of my head, but I'm going to say maybe almost up to a half of the land in the Pinelands right now is permanently protected. So that means that it's e either in state ownership, it's it's a state forest uh, forest area, wildlife management area, state park, um, uh, owned perhaps by a nonprofit conservation organization. I, I think that we can safely say that any of those lands that are permanently protected by virtue of those ownership situations will never, if you can ever say ne never, will never be threatened by, by, by development um, uh, pressures. Uh, it's the land in private development that, uh, I'm sorry, the land that's in private ownership uh, that is perhaps going to be subject to a debate on whether we're gonna allow ad additional development there. But then hopefully that will be couched in the terms of whether there's carrying capacity. Sure. And carrying capacity within the confines of climate change. Sure. Okay. Well, great. Thank you so much. It was a wonderful presentation. I really enjoyed it. Oh, thank you for calling in. Okay. Uh, our lines are open. If anybody else would like to call in. Hey Joel, who's who's up next uh, next Thursday for your next speaker series presentation? Uh, next Thursday's presentation is going to be um, let's see, that's on the twentieth, and that's going to be Anne Heasley and um, Jessica Cortez. Anne is with Sustain Sustainable New Jersey, and uh, um, Jennifer is with uh, DEP, and they're going to be talking about how municipalities can better protect their water resources. Oh, so absolutely, excellent. a number of the topics you talked about today uh, will be part of that program tomorrow. I mean, next next Thursday, and uh, is a, certainly a, be a good for anyone who's involved in the town management who uh, thinks about the water resources. There's definitely going to be some action that they can uh, think about or contemplate or programs going forward uh, that would be useful for them in uh, conserving and better planning for water resource management. That sounds like a good one. I really have to commend you and Paul uh, for putting together such a broad range of topics that have been addressed through the Pinelands Speaker Series. I haven't missed a single one of them. Every one of them has been very good. Uh, 
Thank you. We definitely, uh, when you know, we looked at not having the Pineland short course, not having the summer short course, we thought about, we've got a lot of these good presenters and presentations, particularly dealing with climate change. So we wanted to come up with a platform to uh, get this information out to the public and continue our mission to, you know, educate and raise awareness of the Pinelands and its resources. And uh, these webinars have certainly uh, worked out very well. We've had uh, great attendance. And like you said, they're archived. And so it's kind of a permanent record. So multiple people can come back time and time again and uh, learn this information. And, uh, you know, in the long term, I think it will be something that's important in uh, preserving and protecting the Pinelands. All right. Well, that said, I, uh, I think we're going to call it, Ed. Uh, thank you very much. Again, that was a very informative presentation. And uh, thanks for all your time and efforts putting it together. And uh, you did a great job. And uh, like Ed said, um, come see us next Thursday, and we'll learn a little bit more about uh, protecting water resources on a municipal level. Uh, thanks a lot. And on that note, I'm going to shut down if, if long as that's okay with you, Ed. Yep. Thank you very much, Joel. Appreciate your help. All right. Have a great day. You too. See you out there, everybody.